Hi everyone and welcome back to the last two chapters of our chapter book read aloud. We are going to finish The Night Fairy by Laura Amy Schlitz, illustrated by Angela Barrett. Let's just take a few moments like we always do to go over what we read in the last chapters, the last two chapters that we read last night. Remember that the hummingbird is stuck in a spider's web. And after a lot of conversation, um, Flory trying to make a deal with the hummingbird and the hummingbird refuses. Um, Flory has finally promised the hummingbird that she will go to the hummingbird's nest where there are two eggs and she will warm them and then she will come back to the web, the spider's web and free the hummingbird. So before that she has to get back to her house where she has her dagger. So she calls Scuggle the squirrel and he gets her back there very quickly. She has to make a deal with him of course. She has to promise him cherry seeds and sunflower seeds and other things because you know Scuggle, he's always hungry. So uh, he brings her home, she gets the dagger and then he brings her back to the barberry bush where the nest is, where the hummingbird's nest is. So as she's climbing up to get to the nest, she meets a praying mantis. Now, uh, Flory is afraid that the praying mantis is on his way to eat the hummingbird eggs. She's actually not quite sure that he may even have been there already and has already eaten the eggs. So she doesn't exactly know. She's trying to get him away. And she, um, she distracts the praying mantis by asking for help. She tells the praying mantis that her wings are damaged and she needs help. And in this way, the praying mantis then turns and focuses on Flory as a prey, as her prey. So the, uh, all that practicing, remember all that practicing that she did on Scuggle with that stinging spell? Well, it comes in handy because she does sting the praying mantis and he gets very frustrated and he just flies away and leaves her alone. So she goes back to the spider web and she's talking to the spider. Now she looks at the hummingbird and the hummingbird appears to be either dead or asleep. But the spider explains to Flory that the hummingbird is in a state of torpor, which is a state of inactivity, sort of like um, hibernation, but not as quite a deep sleep. So she, Flory, stings the spider, and the spider is now stuck in its own web. So after more conversation, the spider agrees not to eat the hummingbird and Flory agrees to free the spider, which she does do. So the spider tells Flory that she can't really free the hummingbird right now because if she does, the hummingbird will just fall to the ground because remember, it's in this state of inactivity, of torpor. So Flory stays with the hummingbird all night in the barberry bush and that's where we left her. So chapter nine, the raccoon. Hours passed, Flory swung back and forth on the juniper twig and gazed at the moon. The night breeze tickled her sweetly. The fireflies blinked on and off, now green, now golden. From time to time, Flory heard the faint shh of the grass moving and saw long shadows cross the ground. The earthworms were leaving their burrows, coming out to breathe the moist air. A curious chuckling sound caught her attention. Flory held her breath. A raccoon was drinking from the fish pond. She could hear his tongue as he lapped the water. Noiselessly, Flory got to her feet and peered through the darkness. She saw the grizzled hump of the raccoon's body. He was combing the water, searching for goldfish. Flory prayed that he would catch one and eat his fill, but her hopes were dashed. He looked up, eyes gleaming, nostrils twitching. She could almost feel him smelling her. He came straight toward the juniper bush, his claws making a faint click-click 
on the patio. His eyes flashed yellow in the dark. Now he was close enough that Flory could see his dark mask and the weird prettiness of his face. Who's there, he barked. Flory didn't move a muscle. The raccoon came closer. The long ringed tail swung over the grass like a fat snake. Flory gritted her teeth, clenched her fists, and stung. The raccoon stopped in his tracks. Ow, he said in an annoyed tone of voice. What are you? I'm a night fairy, Flory said with dignity. The raccoon opened his jaws, clicking the roof of his mouth as if he tasted something bitter. I don't eat fairies, the raccoon said. I ate one once and it stung me. It didn't taste very good. Then you'd better leave me alone, said Flory. I sting very hard. I practice a lot. All right, I won't eat you, the raccoon answered glibly. He sniffed again. I smell something good to eat. Is it a bird? Flory's hand went to the hilt of her knife. You'd better go away. She knew that her words, like her threats, were idle. The raccoon was huge, sleek, and muscular. If, he'd up, if he made up his mind that he wanted the hummingbird, she would not be able to stop him. The raccoon chuckled. He had seen the bird. His claw shot out and nabbed the hummingbird, snapping the threads of the spider web. Flory stung as hard as she could. The raccoon gave a little yip. He dropped the bird and put his paw in his mouth. Would you stop doing that? He licked the bottom of his paw. Oof, I hate cobwebs. His tongue swept the edges of his mouth. Then he bent down and picked up the hummingbird in his jaws. Let go, screamed Flory. She grabbed a, a thread of the spider web and swung to the ground. She yanked her hand free, so angry that she didn't feel it when the web ripped off a layer of her skin. You stop, let go of that bird or I'll stab you. The raccoon cocked his head. He loomed over her and his bright eyes twinkled. He was 10 times as big as Scuggle and 30 times as heavy, but Flory was too furious to care. She darted forward and slashed the raccoon's forepaw with her dagger. When she pulled the knife free, there was blood on the tip. Stop that, snarled the raccoon, shaking his paw. Flory thrust again. This time she missed. Silly fairy, said the raccoon. You can't fight me. Leave me alone or I'll have to hurt you. I won't, screamed Flory. Go away or I'll kill you. The raccoon laughed so hard that the hummingbird fell out of his mouth. Flory slashed at him with her knife. This time, the raccoon struck back, smacking her with such force that she tumbled headlong over the grass. Flory sat up and uttered her stinging spell. She was amazed by her own strength. The raccoon winced as she stung again. Her spells were small wounds mere pinpricks under the raccoon's fur. But it was Flory's time, a little before midnight, and her magic was at its strongest. Though the stings were small ones, they came one after another, pelting the raccoon from all sides. The raccoon was losing patience. He had been stung all over his body, and the pad of his front paw was bleeding. He lowered his head and crouched down, growling. A bat squeaked. The cry of a bat is a common sound at night, and the raccoon paid no attention. But Flory threw down her dagger and covered her head with her arms. The bat streaked toward them, coming within an inch of the raccoon's head. The raccoon ducked, and the bat zigzagged back. His mouth was open, showing needle-sharp teeth. 
The skin wings jerked and rippled. No sight could have been more terrifying to Flory. She burrowed into the grass. The bat's squeaks grew softer, then louder. Flory felt the wind of his wings, then softer again. When Flory dared to raise her head, she saw that the raccoon had scampered a few feet away. He sat back on his haunches, a baffled look on his face. I want to show you a picture. There's the bat and the raccoon, and you see Flory in the foreground. Hmm. Little brown bats are insect eaters. They do not attack raccoons, but the bats swoop down again, shrieking. Flory began to understand that he was not after her. He was tormenting the raccoon. She watched as he drove the raccoon across the patio and past the fish pond. The raccoon dodged and ducked, spinning in circles, but the bat would not leave him alone. At last, the raccoon slunk under the garden fence. The ringed tail vanished. The bat chittered with triumph and circled back toward Flory. He flopped down on the grass less than six inches away. Flory was so frightened that tears filled her eyes. Don't cry, the bat said gently. Don't you see? I came to help. Flory's mouth was too dry to utter a spell. Her hand went to her side, seeking her dagger. Your knife's by your left foot, the bat told her. Only please don't stab me or sting me. I don't blame you for wanting to, but please don't. Flory picked up her dagger and got to her feet. She stared at the bat. He was really rather a small bat. His wingspan was huge, like two large pine cones set end to end. But now that he was close to her, she could see that he wasn't much bigger than she was. He was mouse size with a pushed in snout and enormous ears that were set wide apart like moth's wings. He lay belly flopped on the ground with his elbows folded up like jackknives. Flory's voice shook. What do you want? Well, said the bat, I don't want to hurt you, you or your friend. He nodded toward the hummingbird in the grass. How did you come to make friends with a hummingbird? They're not friendly birds, you know. I know, Flory said with feeling. She thought a moment. We're not really friends. I was hoping she would let me ride on her back one day. The bat opened his mouth as if he wanted to say something, but Flory went on speaking. That's how it started. The first time I saw a hummingbird, I knew I wanted to ride on one. I didn't care whether they were friendly or not. I just liked the way they looked. Who doesn't, said the bat. They're beautiful birds, amazing flyers. Of course, bats are good flyers too. He paused once again as if there was something he wanted to say, but Flory interrupted. I hate bats, she said. I know, said the bat humbly. It's my fault. Flory gasped. It was you? I was younger then, the bat said pleadingly. Try to understand. I was asleep for the winter. I'd found a nice little attic for my home. Then one night, the door opened and the giants charged in. They had bright lights in their hands and they were shouting. You'd think they were afraid of us. Lucky, I, luckily, I got away through a hole in the roof, but of course, it was early for me to be out, and I was half asleep and terribly hungry. I saw you, and I thought you were a luna moth. I ought to have known better, luna moths in April, but I wasn't thinking clearly. I see, Flory said slowly. I've been sorry ever since, the bat went on, and I wanted to tell you so. I looked for you night after night. I thought you must have dropped down close to this garden, and I called out to you, but no one ever answered. Then tonight I heard a fairy screaming, 
I came closer and I listened for the echoes and I heard that the fairy's wings were jagged and torn. That's when I knew it was you. Oh, said Flory. She thought of all the nights she had huddled inside the cedar house with cobwebs in her ears, trying to block out the sounds of the bats. There's one more thing, the bat added. He sounded nervous. I know I'm not a hummingbird, and your wings are coming along nicely, but if... Flory held up her hand. Wait, stop. What do you mean my wings are coming along nicely? What do you mean... The bat raised himself up on his elbows. I mean, they're growing back, he said. I can hear them. Can't you? Flory shook her head. She reached down behind her, feeling up and down the ruffle of wings on her spine. The scabs had fallen away. She had known that. She couldn't tell if the wings felt longer or not. She craned her neck, trying to see over her shoulder. Oh, my dear, the bat said softly. Didn't you know? Your wings will grow back as your magic grows stronger. They've already begun. I don't see very well, but I can hear the cells growing. If I listen carefully, can't you? No, answered Flory. I can't hear that well, and I can't see behind me. They're growing, the bat told her. He gave a little shriek and his huge ears rippled. I can hear the echo. You can make mistakes with your eyes, but ears never lie. At least my ears don't. Flory wanted to dance and weep for joy. Then I'll have wings again. She saw herself flying through the garden on her own wings dipping through the spray of the fountain, soaring over the snapdragons. I'll be able to fly. Yes, agreed the bat. And in the meantime, he sounded suddenly shy. If you want someone to fly you around, well, there's me. I'd be happy to carry you. Of course, I'm not as beautiful as a hummingbird. Most creatures think bats are rather ugly but I'd like to help because, you see, I am so very sorry. Flory thought about what the bat was saying. She looked at him with his long, clever fingers and the soft fur around his face. He wasn't glittering and magical like the hummingbird, but Flory liked his face. It was a gentle face, and she felt that she could trust him. I don't think you're ugly, she told him. What's your name? Chapter 10, Homecoming. His name was Peregrine, which means traveler. Flory told him her name meant flower, and all at once they were friends. They passed the rest of the night together, guarding the hummingbird. Together they freed the bird from the spider's silk. Flory used the flat edge of her dagger to drag the cords off the feathers and Peregrine used the thumbnails on the edges of his wings. When the threads clung together, Peregrine bit through them with his sharp teeth. After we finished taking off the web, I could take you for a ride, Peregrine hinted, but Flory refused. I have to keep watch over the, over the hummingbird, she explained. I promised. She hadn't really promised, but she felt as if she had. Peregrine looked so crestfallen that she added quickly, but I'd like to go tomorrow night. I could take you back home, Peregrine said. We could go north where the woods are and find other night fairies. Flory's eyes lit up. She had almost forgotten what it was like to live among other fairies. Then she thought of her little cedar house and the hummingbird's eggs hatching and scuggle. I'd like to go back sometime, she told Peregrine, but I don't think that's my home anymore. I think my home is here. And because the bat with his huge leathery ears was a good listener, she told him all about becoming a day fairy 
and the home she had made for herself. Do you think you'll go on being a day fairy? Flory shook her head. No, but I won't live only at night either. I like night best, but daytime is good too. I like the way the flowers look when they're awake. I like the colors and the birds. Not all the birds are safe, but I like to watch them. She lowered her voice. And I like Scuggle. He's a squirrel, but I like him anyway. She looked at Peregrine to see if he was surprised, but his beady black eyes were shut and he was yawning. The sky was turning gray. It was time for him to go back to his hollow in the oak tree. Perry, she said softly, wake up. It's time to roost. The bat gave himself a little shake. I'm sorry, I must have dozed off. It's time for you to go home, Flory said firmly. It's nearly dawn. Aren't you sleepy? Peregrine yawned again. Not that sleepy, he said bravely. Yes, you are, Flory told him. You're a bat. Go home. I'll stay with the hummingbird. It won't be long before she wakes up, and I'm not frightened. Now that I'm not afraid of you, I'm not afraid of anything. She put out her hand and gave him a little shove. Go on. Peregrine flapped his wings and swerved toward the sky. Flory watched him disappear into the oak leaves. The grass was wet with dew. In a little while, the sun would rise. Flory's eyelids felt crusty, and she rubbed her eyes with her fists. When she caught herself nodding, she got to her feet and circled the hummingbird, her hand on the hilt of her dagger. The hummingbird stirred. The branches were rustling now, and the birds were beginning their early morning chorus. From time to time, the hummingbird shifted. She was coming out of her torpor. Flory went to the bird's head so that they could see eye to eye. Hummingbird, I'm here, she crooned. Are you awake yet? I put a spell on your eggs. They're still warm. I'm almost sure of it. As if in answer, the hummingbird rose into the air. She flew straight to the water tube without looking back. Flory watched as she drank. Birds, she said bitterly. She thought of all she had done for the hummingbird's sake, and she wanted to shout over the unfairness of it all. But she was too weary to shout, and she had a long walk ahead of her. She trudged back toward the cherry tree, head drooping. Then she heard the whir of wings. The hummingbird perched on a clover stalk in front of her. Come, said the bird. Come where, asked Flory. To the nest, answered the hummingbird, as if Flory had asked a stupid question. She flicked her wings impatiently. Hurry up and climb on my back. I want to see my little ones. But you said, I said I wouldn't be your slave and carry you wherever you wanted, the hummingbird answered sharply. This is different. Come along. You've earned it. Climb on my back. Flory didn't need to be asked again. She shoved her dagger in her sash and scrambled up the shining feathers. The hummingbird was surprisingly slippery. Flory folded her legs tightly around the bird's neck. She wished there was something to hold on to. The green grass fell away. At close range, the whir of the wings was like the racket of a waterfall. The flight was glorious but nerve-wracking. The bird dodged and veered so sharply that Flory shrieked. But Flory liked it. She had no doubt about that. Look at that. Isn't that great? You see Flory on the hummingbird's back? Hmm. All too soon, they reached the nest. What's this? asked the hummingbird. Her beak bobbed down and pinched Flory's quilt. It's mine, Flory began. I thought it would keep... <gasps> Under the quilt were two tiny birds. They had shiny black skin and no feathers. They were wrinkled and skinny, and their tiny beaks were like needles. They were very ugly. Flory loved them at first sight. The hummingbird plunged her beak into one open mouth. 
Her stomach jerked in and out as she forced the sugar water she had drunk into the baby bird. Then she turned to the second nestling and fed him. Flory sat on the edge of the nest and watched. She felt a little shy. There, she stopped. No one could call the, the baby hummingbirds beautiful. I like them, she said. Of course you like them, the hummingbird said smugly. They're the most beautiful children you ever saw. Flory put her hand to her mouth to hide a smile. She was just in time to cover a yawn. I suppose you're sleepy, the hummingbird said. You're a night fairy after all. I'm going out for more sugar water. Do you want another ride? Yes, Flory said happily. She thought about her little house and the heavenly softness of her hammock. Please take me home. Her home was tidy and peaceful. Flory crawled through the door hole and stumbled over to the hammock. It had been a long day and a long night. She was covered with scratches and her poppy red dress was shredded so that she would never be able to mend it. All the same, she was very happy. She felt that she had never been so happy in her life. She tore off her dress and climbed into the hammock. Tonight, Peregrine would come and carry her away. She wondered what his flight would be like. She looked forward to finding out. Bats fly high. She would swoop over the garden, close to the moon and the stars. Her eyes closed. She was falling sweetly into sleep. Look, there she is back in her little house. You see Scuggle at the door? <laughs> there was a scratching sound outside the door. Flory ignored it, but the noise grew louder and at, at last she was forced to open her eyes. The light from the doorway was almost blotted out by two twitching paws. You promised me cherries, said Scuggle. The end. That's the Night Fairy. I hope you enjoyed that book as much as I did. Thank you very much for tuning in. See you soon. Good night.